You're listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guests. I gotta tell you something, people. Since I moved back east, it rains a lot. So when I drive in the rain, it's regular radio. But what I noticed is, when I lived in L.A. for all those years, whenever it rained, the DJ would always have to put a song on about the rain. It'd be start drizzling, they'd play November Rain by Guns N' Roses, they'd play Love Rain or Mia by The Who, Riders on the Storm by The Doors, and CCR Who'll Stop the Rain. And it happened every time. You think after a while people get tired, and I think they complain, but they just keep doing it. Anyway, I don't have to deal with that, so it's great. But what I have to deal with today is a great guest. Uh, he's, the, he's the singer from Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. My guest is Scotty Morris. How you doing, Scotty? I'm well, man. Yourself? Good, good. Now, have you 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 live in the West Coast? Did you do you run into that a lot when you're driving? And it rains. The DJ just always plays rain music. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna trade off the fact that it rains so infrequent that I have to deal with that issue at all. Right. It's, it doesn't it doesn't really rain where I'm at, man. It, it, I'm on the beach and it's it's pretty much amazing. And when it rains three days in a row, it's, you know, a major. It's a major shutdown. No one knows what to do with themselves. But you're 100 percent right. They do play those exact songs. Now, what beach are you on? Ventura. Okay, so yeah, Ventura is beautiful. My friend, my friend's actually a detective up there. But um, so yeah, it's always nice up there. You're true, and it's so it's the way it is. So anyway, are you originally? Yeah, so it's, it's beautifully laid back place, man. It's between Malibu and Santa Barbara. For those people that do not know where Ventura is, so it's it's the exact same real estate. It's just not. The fancier place. Now, I know the band started in Ventura. Are you from originally from uh, Ventura? Yeah, I was born. I was born in Ventura. I grew up in a small suburb just uh, south called Oxnard. Okay, and, uh, that's where I grew. I grew up in Oxnard, and then I, and then I, when I got older, I moved to New York and New Orleans, and kind of just traveled a lot just to sort of figure out what I was doing. Oxnard, the home of the Strawberry Festival. That's right. Yeah. So, when when did you start your interest in music? Because I'm going to tell you something. You know, you play such a cool type of music, and you guys look sharp, and you just you just hip. But how did this whole music career start? As a kid, were you musically inclined, or did you play sports, or what happened? Yeah, I, I did. I did a little bit of, the, of all of that. Um, I started off playing music really early, really, really early, and I used to love to just grab whatever instrument. You know, and it was always just something cheap. There was no music, no musicians in my family, but I would just grab anything. If there was a plastic guitar, I'd grab a plastic guitar and I'd hop on the, I'd hop on the coffee table and, and just do my best to, you know, entertain the family at, at, at best. And then, you know, I was really interested in music. And so as the earliest age I can remember is grabbing a trumpet, you know, with school lessons and then and, and, and having, you know, Louis Armstrong records in the house helped me know what that instrument was supposed to sound like and and then when I and then when I listened to New Orleans jazz music it was that was something that just it exploded in me I just it just felt so familiar to me and it felt so good and it felt so right and, and I still feel that way when I listen to that music it it really is pretty special music so as you get in high school do you start forming bands or because so many musicians start you know younger but then they don't start forming bands till high school because you know it's pretty hard to get in somewhere when you're 12 to play but uh when did you start yeah. forming your first band yeah i was i was probably uh, it was junior high i was for sure starting like bands in junior high and i was recording at that point too because um i was always i've always really really been into recording for some reason and so i've had a home some kind of home apparatus to record whatever I was doing as crude as it could be from as early as I can remember from right down from having a just a cassette tape deck where I would play a guitar line and then I would play the cassette tape deck through my stereo and then play a bass line back on the other cassette deck you know what I mean and I just ping pong them back and forth until I'd have my song and, and it just it, it took forever to record but I just something in me just knew that I was supposed to do that and, and that's what uh that's where it started. And I started bands in junior high and then uh, late, late junior high, 79, 80, I, uh, I started, I got into pop and then that was it. I, that's when I started playing original, all original music only and making records and touring and, and doing the whole nine yards. Well, when you were younger, you said when you were recording, were you record? what kind of music were you recording? Your own or were you recording 
jazz or what? What were you recording at that young age when you started with your studio? Yeah, I was re- I was recording original music at a young age. Yeah, and it wasn't it, it, it wasn't jazz. It, I would say that it was probably I would say it was probably you know anything from uh, Beatles to Led Zeppelin rip off you know or anything uh, you know, Steve Miller who knows it's just whatever I was into but mostly probably mostly the Beatles to be honest with you I was I was a huge Beatle fan so I still am but. Yeah, that was probably one of the early ones. Now, just what band drove you to love punk? Was there a certain band you heard that you said, this is what I have to do? Yeah, it was, for me, the music came later. It was the energy of the music for me that, that was really the, the, if something was happening with my age group, with my generation. Something was happening, and I wanted to know what it was because whatever was happening was being translated through music. So I had to find out because I knew coming from Oxnard, I knew there was more out there in this world than just, you know, living by the beach and, and, you know, what sports and whatever. I just knew there was. I could just, you know, I just sensed it, you know. There was something about it. And then when punk rock started to surface its head, you know, the Sex Pistols were getting a lot of attention and the Clash was getting a lot of attention and all these bands were getting attention. So I started kind of looking into it and trying to find out if there were bands and and there were a few really great bands in my hometown, thankfully, that uh, I was able to really latch on to and, and get me behind it. So as far as music was concerned, that came after the initial attraction to something was happening that my, my age group was reacting to, and I, and I wanted to be part of it, or I at least wanted to know about it. So you're, you're playing punk, and that was your goal to play punk. Now, how do you switch gears? I mean, because, you know, big... <laughs> Big Bad Voodoo, that is not punk. I mean, how? What? What ended up? What was the point that you switched? Well, I um, I always played everything. So if if I was you know if I was writing a record with my my boy my my guys and my band for punk rock, um, I was for sure as arrangements for my jazz band at school, and I was for sure you know practicing keyboards for a cover band that I was gigging with on, you know, Thursday night at the, at the, you know, the cheesy nightclub playing, you know, journey covers or whatever. I just, I was always really into to just challenging myself and trying to play, you know, as many different instruments and trying to really try to broaden it out and just play as much music as possible. I just, whenever I was playing music, I was, I was enjoying myself more than anything else. And I kind of discovered that at a pretty early age. So when do you transition into Big Bad Voodoo Daddy? I say '89. I was my last year of music school. I went to MI in Los Angeles, and my last year of music school, um, I started getting a lot of really good gigs, and I started getting more session gigs and sideman gigs. And you know, I was really going to music school just to sort of see what the temperature of music was at that time because it's the late '80s, and I for sure wasn't into hair music, so. I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do, and, and the, I had been writing swing music basically my whole life, and, and that music run through my head, those songs had been in my head for a really long time. And uh, I just figured I would do it with just friends. Like, I, I really wanted to do something safe with just friends. But 89 is when I really sort of put the put the, the, the wheel in motion. It, didn't, it wasn't until 91 that I could actually get people to play it, and then 93 is the lineup that is happening on stage now. Now, how do you recruit someone for that? Because, you know, it, when you listen to swing, it's great, you know, and it's very uplifting, but it, and, or sometimes it can be depressing, you know, some of the songs, but the slower ones, right. but how do you recruit guys to play? Because at that time, you're right, you said you weren't into the hair thing, and that was some, the start yeah. of grunge, it was changing. How do you recruit guys? You know, I, 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 I think because I had really practiced a lot and, and I had really worked on being an unaccomplished guitar player. And I think that I was able to get people's attention. Uh, the guys that I got, my drummer, Kurt Sodergren, I think I got my, his attention because I was able to play. So if, we, if I showed him a song, he was willing to play a song as long as I was willing to do something that he wanted to do. Like he would... He was really into Jimi Hendrix and, and, and like really he wanted to play Wilder stuff. So like in between our own original songs at rehearsals, we just break into something wild and I just go as crazy as I could and he would just feed off that energy. So I think it was really, 
just being a musician that could play many different styles is something that I learned as a studio musician or as, at music school. And I think that was really the way I kind of lured guys in. And then thankfully, when this band started to play live, uh, people were attracted to it right away in a very positive way. It was People always reacted very well to, to Big Bad from the very, very first gigs. Now, tell my listeners, I know how you got it, but tell my listeners how you got the name. Yeah, when I was 17, I snuck in with my brother's fake ID to go see Albert Collins, a blues guitar legend. He's a Texas blues legend. I mean, the guy's just unbelievable. He was my favorite blues guitar player, and he was playing uh, 21 Club, and I was only 19, I believe. I snuck in and went and saw him, and I, he just blew my mind. It was one of the greatest nights of music I'd ever seen. I mean, he like had this long, he was notorious for having this long guitar cable, so he'd play his guitar, and he would literally stand on the tables in the bar and go to the very end of the bar away from the stage, you know, doing these just crazy guitar solos on top of this, the, on top of the, the tabletops. It was just unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it. It was so much energy, and the crowd was just going just bananas, and it was, it was really amazing. And at the end, I grabbed the poster off the wall, and as he was getting on the bus, I asked him if I could get an autograph. And he asked me what my name was, and I said, my name's Scotty, and he wrote, To Scotty, the big bad doo-doo daddy love Albert Collins. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, and I didn't really think much about it, just thought that that was pretty great. And uh, when I was putting the band together, I think one of the reasons why Kurt, my drummer, the reason why I think he even agreed to do swing music in 1991 was the fact that the name was Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. I just, <laughs> I just, I just said it off the top of my head. I'm like, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. And he just got a big old smile on his face. He's going, I'm in. That sounds great. Now, I know you released, you recorded your two first albums. You recorded them yourselves. Um, what, what were you thinking when you were recording them? Because there wasn't really a market for that music. You know, it's like people think, I mean, before, you know, Joe Jackson had done Jump and Jive, which I love, but a lot of people didn't. A lot of people didn't get it. You know, it was a point where, oh, well, we want to hear, you know, do you really want, are you really going out with him? But we hear this. Sure. Where, yeah. what was um, your, what was your. It was, it, well, so we started and we, okay, so uh, technically we started in April and we released our first record in uh, September. So it took from April to September for me to hone that, those songs to the way they were, to the way they are on our very first record. And all that was is that when we started to play live, people were reacting to us very, very good. And we started getting really large crowds really fast in our hometown. Just just our hometown, that's all we were doing. I had no aspirations of anything other than just, you know, having fun, putting this band together. Of, it was almost like a, a relief valve for me because the music that I really loved playing, I was writing all originals, maybe a couple covers here and there, but it was mostly just to blow off steam. And because the record, because the shows were packing in so much, I was thinking, well, we should make a demo and then send it out up and down the coast to see if we could get more gigs. And as we were recording, I just thought to myself, you know what, this sounds pretty good. I'm just going to release it as a record on our own label. And so I had experience from the punk rock days of doing record labels for things like that. So I just did it that way. And um, the record just, it just never stopped selling, you know, and it just, it, it widened our audience immensely which was which was great at the time because we started to really build momentum once those records came out now as a writer are you writing all the parts or are you guys doing getting a little bit from jamming because you have a lot of musicians early on it was i was writing all the parts i was writing pretty much everything all the all the first probably four records i think were pretty much i was doing that and then we would play the songs live enough times and then certain things would start to evolve from that. But I was pretty much writing it all that way. And then as we started to get going, and we added in 97, uh, Josh Levy, our pianist, who graduated from USC with a orchestration degree. He knows what he's doing in that department. So he and I then started to collaborate on these parts because he had a real expertise and he had a real, he had his own real voice in, in this stuff so it was it was interesting how it went from me kind of dictating to the guys on kind of how it goes to me and Josh working these things back and forth to turning out to what they what they end up now and that's pretty much how we still work I, I pretty much write most of everything and Josh he arranges it and he and I just go back and forth and, 
and so we're both happy with it, and then we bring it to the guys, and then they make it sound great, to be honest with you. Now, your second album was a Christmas album. What what, what made you want to go that way? I just like, I like, I like the, the sort of irony of it, you know, I, I, I wrote, I wrote three, three Christmas songs, and one song is Rockabilly Christmas, which is ridiculous, and the other one is called Christmas Time in Tinseltown, about Santa Claus picking my pocket. I was really spoofing. It was really just, I was really just spoofing Christmas, and I thought it would be fun to just throw out a couple songs, because we were playing holiday parties beyond belief. Like, we, we would do five, six, seven, eight holiday parties throughout the, the season, so I thought, it might be fun to throw in a couple of holiday songs while we're in December, just so that it will feel like, you know, we're contributing to the to the party, to the fun. And it just kind of it kind of grew from there. Now, when did you get the the, the keen fashion sense? Did that happen in the very beginning? Because, you know, you guys dress good, you look good, and who did you start that because you knew the kind of music you're gonna play, or when did that start? Well, I, I always I was always attracted to the to the black and white noir movies and things like that. I always I always really liked that look. I always liked the way that the guys looked in that. And even even early on in the punk rock scene, you know, when everybody was was had, had hair spikes and things like that, you know, and color hair or whatever, and I was always flicking my hair back, and I was always wearing old vintage suits, and I was always wearing you know, two. I would buy the old Spectator shoes, like real old Stacey Adams from the. 20s and 30s I was always rocking that so it was just weird enough to fit in with the punk rock people but it was just kind of a thing that I and it's just kind of an aesthetic that I just I dug I've always dug that look I just thought it was I thought it was cool it was like you know you know romantically thinking in my head you know it was when you know men looked like men and women looked like women and it was this whole thing you know where I don't know it's just a, a romantic notion for a you know a 20 year old thinking that it was you know very cool and and I just like it. I just I like that I have respect. I, I like that our band has respect for the music and for the guys that came before us. And we sort of try to uphold it, try to look as good as possible. And it's fun collecting vintage ties and vintage suits. You know, over the years, we've just, you know, every thrift store known to man we, we've been in and, and you know, ravaged their, <laughs> their thrift stores. You know what's funny about thrift stores? Because it's changed so much. I remember I graduated college in 86. And I remember I had a job in sales in 88. And I went to this, outside Philadelphia, I went to this thrift store. And I got this almost like a dark shark skin suit. Unbelievable suit for yeah. like four bucks. And I always cracked up. I'm like, somewhere a guy died who's built just like me. And what's, fu yeah. what's funny is when I would wear it, people were like, oh, is that Brooks Brother? And back then, no one was getting into the vintage stuff as much during the years you must have seen the whole trend change where people now go ape shit over vintage stuff yeah totally it's and it's funny because now that that i'm in my 26th year of doing it in public you know with big bad voodoo daddy i uh i've seen it come and go three times now i've seen it come and go three times which is crazy now, it's so crazy. I've seen, I've seen it get popular, get cold, get hot, get cold, get hot. <laughs> it's just amazing. So, so you guys are looking smooth. You're playing in the two CDs. How how does Swingers come about? Well, at the time, at the time of that second record, the, the Christmas EP came out. So the first one came out in September of '94, and then the second one came out in October of '95. And at that point we were really all over the place. We were starting to go to New York. We would we were able to go to, as far as New York playing wise. We started to really build a little like underground momentum. And we started a gig in Los Angeles at the Derby. Okay. And the Derby is a Derby that's called the Derby Club. And it was one of Cecil B. DeMille's, I believe there were four clubs, uh, four Derby clubs. And it was, you know, the intention back in the, the 30s was where the celebrities could go and people with paparazzi would be wait outside take their picture but when they're inside it was the glamour of all glamour and no paparazzi so you could do they could let their hair down and the, the derby that we were playing was the last standing derby it was the very last one that was in existence and it had this great vibe in there and we would play every Wednesday and we had a really big crowd in there every Wednesday and John Favreau was a regular of the 
Wednesday night dancing. And at one point, he just, he and I befriended each other and, and became friends and just would hang out on Wednesdays. And if we were playing somewhere on Thursday, low close by, he'd always come. We'd hang, became friends. He started coming down to my house in Ventura. He, I didn't even know he was a writer. He'd come and hang for the weekend. And we just became friends. And, and then one day he just goes, hey, I wrote a script. You guys interested in doing it? We're going to shoot it in like two weeks. And uh, that's pretty much how it happened. John just had to be the script. And, and any way you look at it, because I, I don't know how to read scripts, um, I was going to do it anyway because I really dug the guy. He was just a great, great guy. Smart. I knew he was so smart and so together. I didn't know he was a writer. I, I knew he was trying to be an actor. I didn't know he had done Rudy because he had lost so much weight when, when, I had, when we were hanging out together. And um, he was, didn't even look like that character. And then he asked me, and then we shot it, and it was just not, not a big deal. And I think, I, I think if I remember correctly, I think we might have were paid maybe $1,200 to do it all in. Like, that was, that was the thing. Well, then the movie the movie just blows up. I mean, I was living in L.A. at the time, too. And you started seeing people yeah. all, you know, acting, the swingers thing. But when you, I mean, when did you find out that the movie was blowing up and just now everyone knew your music? Well, it started to become clear because when, when it came out, I believe it came out like in October of 96. And it, it, I remember it was the end of the year. And I remember we had already had a whole... Uh, we had a whole winter tour already going and so we were we didn't even know what swingers was going to be we had no idea that it was going to do anything you know you just don't know you never know anything and and it it came out and it was doing so well and i remember we were probably playing clubs we were probably selling out clubs pretty much from here from california to you know new york intermittently you know certain places we weren't playing but we were playing pretty much every like you know college town in America and we were probably putting 300, 400 seats in every single venue there selling out the small clubs and whatnot and then it just became you know it went from 300 to 600 to 1,000 to 3,000 like you know pretty much in the blink of an eye and it was pretty amazing and the energy was was unbelievable and then the opportunities became you know endless basically well you know it's funny when you said when you guys were touring before it was blowing up you were playing you know, New York and stuff like that. It must have been hard to travel, though, because you have a big band, you have lots of instruments, you have probably lots of clothes because you're all dressed nice. Was it a gruel uh, traveling, or, or how did you guys pull that off? Because, you know, there's you know, no, a big I think band. That's the reason that, I think that's the reason why we're still together is because it wasn't a drag. It was really fun. And you know what, man, to be totally honest with you, man, we were just, we were young, we were poor, we were dumb, and we were just, we would all take one suit, maybe three shirts, you know, three, four different ties, and we would just, we would just rage. We would just go across the country, and we get along so well. It's ridiculous. I mean, we really get along well, and we just, I mean, every night was so much fun because it felt like something was happening. Like, like I was asked once about a couple of years ago. The guy said, you know, the punk rock scene or the swing scene. Like, what was more fun? Like, what was more you know, energetic, and I was like, man, the, the, the punk rock scene and the swing scene, for me, they felt very close to the same because something was happening. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how big it would get, but something was definitely happening because everywhere we would show up all across the country, people were dressed to the nines, man. People were swing dancing. People looked cool. They were wearing old vintage, you know, thrift store suits, and it was just super fun. So it was really a lot of fun. So it wasn't grueling. It wasn't even grueling until, you know, we got older and you have kids and, you know, you're changing diapers at, you know, five in the morning and then you get up, you know, an hour later to go fly to, you know, right. Texas and you know, that's when it got grueling. <laughs> now, you guys, you, you're, you're blowing up, you're starting to fill places, you're getting bigger and bigger. Does Interscope come to you or, or did you start getting courted by a bunch of different record companies or how did, how did you sign with a major label? Yeah, the, the way it worked out was that we, um, with the record labels, I wanted to do our own label because I had already started our, our own label. And I always, you know, I kind of think of Big Bad Bad Daddy as a punk rock band. I always have. And I don't mean by music. I just mean by, we've always been really DIY. Like that was just always been the mantra of how we want to do things. And the label, Coolsville, 
was Brad Benedict, who had done all the Ultra Lounge stuff on the Capitol label. He was starting his own label, and, and we did a song for him where he, record, he recorded us in Capitol, and that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to record our next record at Capitol, so I'm like, that's great, we'll go record one song for you, but it just went so well with those guys, with the, with the Coolsville guys, that we signed with Coolsville, and Coolsville was signed to Capitol, so our first deal was with Capitol, Coolsville Capitol. And then when Capitol went through the big shakeup because grunge was falling and the, they got rid of the president of the label, right in the middle of our, uh, right in the middle of our record cycle with our big record, um, we had to scramble to find a net label. So our record, six months into the release of our record, we lost our deal with Capitol because Capitol, the Capitol that we were signed to is called E-Prop, Capital E-Prop. It, um, it went under to do this on. And so Interscope was the first big call that came because the record was was charging towards a platinum record. So we, we, were, we, had, we were in somewhat of a driver's seat position at that, at that moment. So that's why Interscope happened. Now, what was it like when you went and recorded that from coming from... You were recording at home. You were wanted your own record label. You know, you basically probably had full, complete control. When you went with Capital at first, did they give you control, or were they butting their heads in? No, in the in the deal, one hundred percent control. And they, that's yeah, I had I've, I've I've had one hundred percent control over everything we've done the entire time. Like we've never had anybody, we've never had anybody um, on my back ever. Now. The album comes out, and you guys are getting a bigger crowd, but as you said, you start being everywhere. Your crowds start growing. How does your travel start? Do you get a bus now? Or, you know, as I said, because it always amazes me, you know, I used to do stand-up comedy, and when there was comedy teams, we'd be like, they got to split all the money. And it was just, they had to travel together. Like, if you were by yourself, you could just right. get on your own. As you guys were getting bigger, how did your travel and accommodations change? Well... Because there's 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 seven core members, and at that time there were seven core members, and then we had I always brought a sound man, and I always brought a monitor guy, and and they switched between road managing also and production managing. So so we traveled with a we would travel in a van, and we would travel in a small rider truck with our gear and suitcases, and we did that all the way. I'd say we did that for almost. Jeez, from 94 we did that until 90, late 98. Like, yeah, 98 for sure. Like the first major tour we did when our first major label record came out, we were in our van still. We were still in our van, we were still in a rider truck and we went out for two and a half months. Now you're, you're getting bigger. Now how does the Super Bowl come about? I mean, that's just, that's as big as you can get. Yeah, at Radio City, Radio City Music Hall at the time, where they, they were the ones that were in charge of the Super Bowl, and they um, they were they were playing with the idea of getting one of these bands, one of the swing bands they were looking at. I want to, I think it was us. It was between us and Brian Setzer, I think. And we were we were doing the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. It was our first appearance, and I had lost my voice, and. Um, we did the song and Jay was kind enough to have me come and sit with him and tell my story. And the, the guys that were booking the, um, the halftime show who are from the Radio City liked what I, what I said and they liked, they just liked my overall thing and they thought these guys would be great. So they ran it up the flagpole and it, it worked. It flew. Stevie Wonder liked the idea. And because he, he was going to do Sir Duke, and Sir Duke is about Duke Ellington. So it, it just all kind of worked. It worked kind of interesting together. What did you say on Leno that uh, that just impressed him? Uh, I don't think it impressed him as much as it made him laugh. He, he, Jay said, you did an instrumental or something. I don't remember because I never watched any of that stuff back. But I think he said something to the fact that, I think he said, you know, you did an instrumental. I, are you guys known for your instrumentals? And I said, no, I lost my voice. And he goes, you lost your voice. He's like, where did you lose your voice? And I said, and I made a joke. I think I made a joke saying somewhere between, you know, somewhere in the air between 
Toronto and in, in, in California or something, and, and he laughed, and I guess I got a laugh in the audience or something. I don't know. I guess the way it came out was 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 interesting to them or funny to them. I don't know. I don't remember because it was it was so fast. Right. Right? But, but yeah, it was it was something about it was just something about the energy I think of of the moment. Things were just really lined up, man. I gotta be honest with you. Things were just really lined up. Now tell me though what what it what was going through your head and everything when you were playing the Super Bowl because you know it's the biggest crowd that watches a music event. I mean, they're watching the game. I thought, was, I thought it was gonna I thought it was gonna fall through, man. I, I didn't think it was really happening, you know? Like I didn't really think that was really happening. Like it didn't even seem real to me. It seemed like it, it seemed like it it just seemed it didn't seem real to me. Because we never stopped working. We never stopped working up to the Super Bowl. Like, we worked the day before we flew to Miami to do the Super Bowl. We had been working, but two or three weeks before the Super Bowl, we were in Miami at the other stadium doing the Orange Bowl. So we're the only band, I think, in history to do the Orange Bowl and the Super Bowl halftime shows in the same year. And so we had just been doing like all this, we were just doing all this work and we were just working, working, working. And then the next gig was the Super Bowl. So for me, I was really in the mode because we had been playing so much and it just was, everything was kind of mowing forward, but it really just seemed surreal to me. And, and I honestly said it during the press conference when the guy asked me, when did you realize you were doing the Super Bowl? And I said, when you just asked me that question, because <laughs> I honestly can't believe that this is really happening. So it's pretty mind blowing. I mean, yeah, well, it's like, and everyone watches the Super Bowl. I mean, it's just something after the Super Bowl, after you're on there, what happens the next day? Do your record sales go up? People probably who didn't know you know you now, and they probably recognize yeah. you. What happened the next day when you sat there and when you woke up and you went, "Holy shit, we just did the Super Bowl. Our career's gonna go." even crazier than it is. I was a little bit worried, to be honest with you. I was a little bit worried about it because I was afraid that if the, the presentation of the show was going to be really, like, campy and over the top, because you got to remember, I come from punk rock, so I'm always... My, my, my aesthetic is definitely trying to be cooler than, than flashier, you know? And I don't know if that's an oxymoron because my band is... Is pretty flashy, but but I think um, I think I just wanted it to be cooler. And I mean, there was like you know guys in sparkly zoot suits on stilts, and I was just thinking like, oh, and I was thinking like, oh no, man, this is this is going to be bad. Like I wasn't really stoked when that, the rehearsals. And I had asked, please no like glitzy like pinstripe suits and silly like the, it, don't make it look circusy, make it look cool. Like let's do something cool. And and it was really bright and really wild and really flashy. And so I was a little bit nervous about it, but to answer your question with record sales, um, I believe that the record spike was like 75%. So, I think we had a 75% up upgrade. Now, that's just insane. I mean, you know, you think about it, it's something that, you know, and that's why people do buy stuff. I mean, it's, and that's funny, that's when there was records. I mean, now, if someone goes and sings, yeah, yeah, yeah. if they sing a single, everyone's going to buy it. You know, I, I laugh when, I remember when the Who played the Super Bowl, and the, the Super Bowl was on CBS, and they played all the songs that were their lead-ins for uh, CSI. And the funny is, the people who are really digging into Who wouldn't go out and buy the albums because they already had them. For you guys, it's people right. had them, but you had your core base and you were getting bigger and bigger. You probably got introduced to a whole new group of people. I think that that's, that's, that's exactly what happened. And, and, and I, to be honest with you, I think that a lot of the fan base that's there now, that's still there now, because we're still out touring, we're still out doing our thing. Uh, we're still doing 100, between 120 and 150 shows a year. And uh, and I want to say that that probably that that base that audience that that Super Bowl reached, I would probably say is a, probably a, there's a good share of that that audience in the crowd every night, which is amazing. Now know? now when you, after the after the game, you guys you have a new a, a bigger fan base. Do people start showing up in like jeans or you know because it's something that you guys are it's it's more than just a concert. It's like 
it's a night out. You know, as you said, you like the old when a man was a man and just the cool suits. Did people always dress, start dressing? When did they start dressing the way to look hip when you guys started making it bigger? Right when we started touring early. Like, it, it went away. It went away. Like, I would say it went away way more during the era of the Super Bowl because that's when it got more, it was much more mainstream. And so, for instance, like, it was more college. Like, when the college kids are into it, like, the college kids can't afford to, to buy suits, even though thrift stores and whatnot, most can't. Like, if they do, they just kind of throw something together. So I would say that it became more... It became more main. It was much more mainstream at that point. That's one thing that, that definitely our audience changed in that moment. Like when we were, became a very popular band, especially like playing all the colleges and all of that that kind of thing. That's one thing that really changed. And my my idea at that time was as much as we were playing the colleges, I wanted to make sure we were playing performing arts centers just as much because I didn't want, I wanted to create a new fan base because I know that the college scene, because I was a college student, I know that it's here today, gone tomorrow. So I really wanted to make sure that, that we were also playing performing arts center theaters and things of that nature so that we could start to cultivate a new audience, an older audience, uh, an audience that respected the music so much as not the outfits and just the, the exterior, you know, like there was more, we were trying to make more going on than just, just, you know, this flashy exterior. So that was really kind of what, what the move was at that point. Now, as you, as you're becoming bigger, I mean, you know, after 98 and going to 99, how does your writing change? Do you still sit there and think we're going to do the same kind of songs? Where are you coming from when you're writing now? Because you have a sound, people want to hear it, but then, you know, you probably sometimes wanted to write another kind of sound. Yeah, I always did. And I, I, it didn't stop me from writing other kinds of music. Um, I just didn't release any of it because I, I thought it was kind of counterintuitive to the to the big guys of daddy. I didn't want to confuse people. I didn't want to. I didn't want to mess with the brand name because you know I had talked six other guys into putting their life on hold so that I could they would play my swing music. So I I stay pretty committed to that that fact and and really the the record that followed the Super Bowl that whole era. You know, that's a much more introspective record lyrically. You know, I tried to make the best record I could, but literally we probably played in that that 16-month period, you know, we probably played 320 shows during that time. And to try to, to try and to try, to try to play that many shows at the energy that Big Bad Big Daddy performs at and then write really good songs and, and work on those good songs, and there just was no free time. You know, there was just, it just, it was really incredibly hard. So that, that record, it's called This Beautiful Life. That record is, that's a, that's a hard record for me to play songs live because I think it, it's so introspective for me, I think, maybe because it was just such a hard record to make. You know, I wasn't enjoying music like I had before because it became such a big business. There were so many people pushing me to make this record because there was a lot of money on the line for these people, you know, and I... And I didn't know that. I was, you know, young and dumb, and I was just trying to be the best that I could. So it was pretty interesting that, you know, trying to find my, my way in that was, was pretty tricky, I have to be honest. Now, lyrically, how does it work? Because it is a quicker beat, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's lyrically, you really have to think hard because you know i mean you can write great lyrics if it's a real slow song but when it's something because you know swing is is beat it's quick it's thing i mean yeah. how how would you attack that the lyrics when you would be writing a new song a lot of times it's stream of conscious to be honest with you if i have a I, i'm one of those i'm one of those songwriters that when i hear i hear music in my head all the time so i hear i hear songs in my head always so I usually have two or three songs rolling in my head all the time. And and then when I'm writing, what I'll do is I'll just sit down with a guitar or piano and I just try and suss out what I'm hearing in my head. And then usually it's not lyrics, but it is a melody. I hear the melody for sure. Sometimes it's lyrics. And then I just kind of get on the instrument and I sort of just 
I sort of just play and sort of whatever comes out of my mouth is sort of it's trying to tell me something you know that's, that's the way I look at it it's trying to tell me something so I just kind of let the process kind of work itself out sometimes it's a very fast process sometimes the lyrics just come right out and it's, it just makes itself very clear that this song is about this and then I have to like either own it or try and change it or sometimes it's very hard and it, it takes me weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks just to get you know the right phrase so it doesn't, you know, so it's not bobbled. Now, you also played at the ESPYs a few times. You were a house band, right? Yeah, yeah, during that period, yeah, that year and the next year we did it, yeah. Now, that's also another different crowd you're getting now. I mean, it must be, you guys were lucky into the fact that you got exposure to so many different people. Yeah, it was amazing. That was, that, those are some, those are some, I'm very proud of, of, of those moments because, the SBs, to be honest with you, the, the first SB we did, the one at Radio City Music Hall, we had a the guy that was in charge of it, his name is John Colby, and he was the music director, and he's awesome. He's a great musician. He does a lot of he does a lot of music cues for ESPN. He did it at the time, and um, man, he just let me do it because we had done a lot of house band stuff in the past. You know, early before Swingers, we were on a Fox Television show, a primetime show on Sunday nights called The Big Deal. And we were doing, we were completely left alone. I could write all the cues, the whole nine yards. And um, and then we would go on TV shows, Regis and, and Kelly, and on all those shows, we would go on. They would have us be the house band. We did, like, all those shows. And we'd just be the house band. We'd walk, we'd play people on. And so that's kind of how that kind of played its way into, into working. And to John Colby's credit, the first one, he let me pick all the cues. He let me call it. He let me run the whole show. And we did that whole thing, I want to say, with no charts, with no nothing. I would just tell the guys what we were doing and count it off, and we did it. And we flew with the first SBs without a net. There was no net, man. We just completely went for it. Now, down the road again, you recorded another, in 2004, you recorded another Christmas album, right? Now, how did, where did that come from? Because your first Christmas album, as you said, was sort of like, you know, tongue-in-cheek. Was this one a serious yeah. one, or what was what was this one about, and what made you want to do a Christmas album? I See, I love Christmas music. It was an, yeah, yeah, it was an extension for sure. I, 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 you know, I've grown to like Christmas music a lot. And um, the thing with, with that is we were touring, again, so much during December months, it would always feel kind of silly to me to not, like, throw a tune in there like this poet let's do a christmas tune so i would try to write one i would every year i would try to write a, a christmas tune or the the stipulation at that time was whoever can find the most off the wall christmas song that would fit into what we do will will do it I, i'll totally go for it so i would always go and try to find really weird and fun christmas songs or any kind of holiday song that would work that, that i could find and then it just kind of dawned on me like we've got like nine tunes we should probably do a record now with this and just put it out there and you know not we didn't promote it we put it out on our own label and we just it just kind of we just kind of put it out there and, and then it found an audience which is which is really which was really great for us because then we had december was then our christmas our holiday show whatever you want to call it it was the holiday show and and it became a very fun and popular season for us to tour every single year on this on this holiday record and then after about you know eight or so years later after doing that that same thing we made another record of holiday music with all different holiday music because the tour was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger so it was time to do something so that's why there's there's another holiday record even after that one okay well now between the one in 2004 you don't record anything for a while and then you come out with the cab calloway uh we well, we recorded. We recorded. We we did. We recorded. Um, Save my soul in 2003. We did the Christmas record in 2004, and we did a live record in 2005. And then, the, and then the Catholic record came. Now, what made you decide that you wanted to go that that route? Because once again, you know, it's one of those things. People love Cab Calloway, so I I think there's sort of maybe want you you have to prove that i mean what made you want to play cat calloway were you just, when you, had you had you become a big fan or were you a fan when you were younger yeah i was a fan from from day one i i pretty much 
I, I pretty much tried to kind of pattern my character after Cab Calloway. Like, Cab Calloway was one of those guys, and I'd known this for a really long time, because I read his book, that he had pretty much the same band for 17 years. And I just admired that, and I wanted to do that too. I wanted to have a band, you know, for 17 years, you know, of all the same guys. Like, he was able to have the same guys for, for a really, really long time. So I really, I really looked up to Cab, and, and I felt like Cab Calloway... I thought that the inspiration that he gave me was worthy me giving back and exposing his music to a whole other generation. And to be 100% honest, my idea about the Cab Calloway record is I wanted to do the Cab Calloway record after our first major label, the first big one. I wanted that to be our follow-up because it would have been a bigger audience, but because we were on a major label, that's the only time the major label told me no. Now, how did you pick the songs you were going to do? Because there's so many. As you said, you know, 17 years, and yeah. you had a long career. Yeah. You know, and being a fan, I mean, when you're a fan, like I'm a big Springsteen fan. There's songs I like that people have never heard, and people don't want right. to hear. And people, you know, so they're going, ah, Springsteen sucks, whatever. Then I wouldn't listen to that. How did you decide what songs you would put on that album? Well, I think I'm a, I'm a pretty big Cab Calloway fan. And I really wanted to do the songs that influenced me. Like, these are the songs that influenced me. These are, if you want to find any blueprint to the way I write or the way I have approached music or have tried to approach music, I think that the Cab Calloway catalog of songs that we did on that record, those songs are songs that moved me at some point. Like, I have, those were, those are hugely influential. Now, I didn't care about I didn't care about marketability at all, and I actually had to be talked into doing Minnie the Moocher again on that record. Just because you were, I mean, just because everyone knew it, or it wasn't one of your favorites, or yeah, what? we had, we had already we had already done it on on our first major label record. We did it on that record, and I'm like, we did it. We've already done it. And then you know, the label, the guys that were around us, you know, and our manager at the time, he just he pleaded with me over and over and over, please, 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 just do it. I think you'll you'll be happy in the end that you did. Now, when that album came out, I mean, you, well, you've had a very um, dedicated fan base. You know, people have gotten into the scene. I mean, you've created a scene that, you know, you, it's more than a concert. It's, it's, it's a scene when you go. I mean, people dress up. They dress nice. How did your diehard fans, did they really dig that? Because not knowing it was your music and it was a tribute to them, how did your fans take it? Loved the record. That record is still one of our, one of our, I'd say it's probably one of our most popular records. And it's something about those tunes too. I, I put those songs on the shelf. I put like 90% of those songs on the shelf probably for the last four years, maybe five years. Cause you know, we've done probably two tours, three tours of that music. And so I was pretty much like, I'm going to put it on the shelf for a while. I pulled out I don't know, a handful of songs off of that record that we hadn't done in probably five, six, seven years. And we're doing it on the road now as we're on touring through the summer. And geez, I love those songs. Yeah, and those songs are so much fun to play. Now, what is it when you were recording them? Because as you say, you were such a big fan of his. Would you second guess yourself anytime saying, you know what? he This isn't as good as he could do. I mean, it must be hard to sit there and play songs. make, And you want to make sure that they are a perfect tribute to him somewhat. I mean, what was it like when you were recording that? You know, it didn't even dawn on me. Like, it, it, I want the idea happened, and I'm not insecure. I'm not an insecure person. And so I basically, my, my philosophy on it was is that I was doing, I was doing that record for the right reason. Like, I know inside of me that I was doing that record for the right reason. So I didn't have anything to fear. And so I just went and did it as, as good as I could. My band did it as well as we could, and we worked really hard at getting those arrangements right. We worked really hard at putting great performances in. It didn't dawn on me, though, until I had to do the vocals. Like, I made sure I did my homework, obviously, and I didn't want to go in and, 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 and nick cabs every single syllable to the way he did things. I wanted to do it my way. But when I got in there and started doing some of those songs, 
that's when it really actually made me realize, like, wow, this isn't just this isn't just the blues, man. He's not just he's not scanning through there. He's doing some seriously heavy stuff, and and it was really really tricky and really really hard, and it really challenged me. And I learned so much about myself on that record. It was such a it was such a great edu- education for me. Now, now I mean, you've recorded a few albums since then. Do you ever want to change your style for you? I mean, would you ever think of doing a solo album? I mean, what is it for you? Because, you know, as you grow as a writer and you produce amazing music, but like anything in life, we change as we get older. You know, it's like, you know, and things change. Have you ever thought about just saying, you know what? I mean, you said you've written songs. And you've always written. Have you ever sat there and said, you know what? I should do a solo album completely different. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great question, and 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 that's a really valid and, and honest question because, yeah, I do all the time. I think about that all the time. I thought about it in '98. I thought about it in '99. I thought about it in 2000. I think about it all the time. And so the way I do that is when I have downtime and I've got the songs that I know are done, arranged, written, and worked on for Big Bad Buddha Daddy, I. I write and work on my own songs. I work on these other songs. But see, Big Bad Daddy is an extension of me, my uh, solo record that I'm doing. It's just a certain kind of music. So yes, I have probably 50 or 60 songs recorded that are completely different. And it, it can go everything from straight up rock and roll to um, bluegrass. I have country songs. I have like like 1950s Johnny Cash style country songs. I love that era. I have some Buck Owens kinds of songs. Um, I have rock songs. I have alternative songs. You know, I have all kind. I have bossa nova songs. I have jazz songs. I have all kinds of music. I have Latin music that I've written. I have all kinds of songs that are just kind of stowed away. And you know, like I'm just I'm just compiling and compiling and compiling and making them as as good as I can. And and it's kind of a nice outlet. Haven't released them yet. Don't know if I will. Don't know, you know, under what, you know, I, I like I said, I'm still really committed to my guys and I'm really committed to Big Bad Buddha Daddy. So I don't want to convolute the water, but, you know, probably wouldn't matter either way if I did or not. Now, what is your fan base like now? Are they older? Are they younger? Do you, I mean, you know, it's like, I, I go to so many concerts that, you know, sometimes you're surprised when you see someone young at a concert. You're like, wait a second, we're at, you know, we're at... A, a Chicago and REO Speedwagon concert. Why is this 18 year old there? What is your crowd base? Yeah. Like? And have, have you had it? Our, no, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's 35. It's it's. I would say that the youngest our crowd is right now. Like when I look in the crowd, I would say young parents like 35. I would say 35 to. I'd say 35 to 75, and I'd say the bulk of our audience is 50 to 75. Now, how many guitars do you own? Do I own? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'm in my studio right now as I'm talking to you, and in front of me right now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I have thirteen on the wall, and I have probably another twenty-five in storage. Now, now, how many suits do you own? Oh, probably the same. Now, is it is it harder to play when you're dressed up like that? I mean, it's you know, you have, it's something that is it constricting at all? I mean, you know, music's music, but it must be crazy. And do you ever worry your hats, good guys, hats are going to fall off? You know, I, I mean, I always wear hats. I always wear fedoras anyway. I just always like them. But but you know, you know, I think that if I had to start a band now and and I had to wear a suit and I'd never worn a suit live before. It would probably drive me nuts, and I'd probably hate it more than anything. But because when we started, we started wearing really heavy wool vintage suits, and we would just sweat through those things like nobody's business. And they would get so heavy because they would get wet. And the next night we'd be on tour, and the next night you just, you just, the first five minutes of putting that suit on, you just, you, they were still a little moist, and it was like it was unbelievable. So it, it was. It was the worst circumstances ever, and they would smell like wet dogs. It was just unbelievable, man. Our, our backstage, was, it was like a, a, it was a female repellent, man. I'm telling you. And, uh, and, and the, the, so it, over the years, though, we've gotten smarter and have custom made suits that are lighter and, and much more forgiving. So it's way easier 
busier now than it's ever been. But yeah, that's a funny question. Now, when you guys travel now, how do you travel? Because you have a lot of equipment, a lot of guys. You have a tour bus and then a, a, a bus, a truck that takes your equipment. How do you? How do you travel? Yeah, we have a, yeah, we, we have a truck. We have a truck and we have a bus. Now, and we fly. Now, what's the future of uh, of you guys? Are you going to record more, or what? What is? What are your goals in the next few years for for your band? Yeah, um, it's that's it's it's all systems go. Um, the, the, we just we just released a record last year called Louis Louis Louis. It was our last record label um, deal record for um, Savoy Jazz Sony, and so we're we're done. We don't have to make any more records for anybody else. So now we're going to go back to the way we've always done. And the goal is two EPs, two five song EPs, twenty twenty. Uh, and then at the end of the year, we will combine those EPs into an LP, which is vinyl only, and there'll be two extra songs, two bonus songs on that. And so two records, two EPs coming in, and then I'm going to try and kick out five songs every other quarter. That's my goal. Well, that's and touring, just keep touring. That's awesome. Yeah, I want to thank you for... Uh coming on you know i'm sort of bummed i know you're playing the starlight bowl and i lived in burbank for 14 years like i lived in I, oh. like it's right there. it's like you know it was a lift ride away because you can take your own booze into the starlight bowl and it's just it's a great there's yeah, always awesome. great crowds and so so the website is bbvd.com they can get all the info there now are you on twitter right. or or on facebook yeah big bad little daddy official is um the the instagram go to instagram Big Bad Little Daddy official. That's our Instagram, and it's it's a killer Instagram. We work really hard on it. We're super social media friendly. Come see us. We're on Facebook, Big Bad Little Daddy, and then you said it with the bbvd.com is our our web, and we are on Twitter as well. We pretty much do it all, and uh, we try to keep. I mean, if you go on our if you go on our uh, our Instagram page, you will see so many unbelievable pictures in our. And our and our cachet, it's, it's it's unbelievable. We uh, on our twenty five year anniversary, almost every day we pop like two or three, just unbelievably great candid pictures. That's awesome, man. So I want to thank you again, people. Please go check out the website. Check out, just follow them. Listen to their music. Go buy some albums. You know, you're always buying singles. No, buy a whole album. Get the Cab Calloway one. And, you know, entertain yourself and get smarts. Anyway, so follow Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. I'll go to my website, Cooper Dog. CooperTalk.net. I have over, God, over 730 episodes. Email me, Cooper, at CooperTalk.net. Um, Twitter, at CooperTalk. And you know what's weird? Uh, go on the Amazon, and the cookbook I wrote six years is actually selling some copies. And you can look it up, Stop nice. the Salt. Uh, so people, have a great day. I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, take your vitamins, eat your vegetables, and I'll talk to you next time.